Thank you for joining us to, to discuss something that is of great importance to all of us who think about this school, and that is what we're preparing our students to do. Uh, we typically prepare, or, or at least our students typically go into ministry, that is about a third of them. About a third of them go on into some type of academic position and about a third of them do other things professionally. Uh, and they range from uh, serving as civil rights attorneys to people who serve on uh, large corporations and are executives in those corporations to people who are running not-for-profits. So we have, as some call the uh, for-profits, I like to call these people, we have the former profits, that is people who come to us from corporations, but we also have the latter profits, people who go on uh, and make a living. So we, we have a better, very heterogeneous group of people to prepare, and we have a wonderful panel to discuss what we're preparing our students to do. Unfortunately, David Kelsey is ill today, uh, so we've imposed upon one of our distingu <coughs> distinguished faculty members, Bob Wilson, uh, the Hoover Professor of Religious Studies and a professor of Old Testament to serve as the uh, host of the panel, to direct the panel. Bob was educated at Transylvania and then here at Duke both for his, yeah, at, Yale, I mean, at, <laughs> at Yale. Uh, uh -oh. That was a bad slip. A BD, as it was called then, today an MDiv, and then his master's and his PhD. And many of us have read a number of his books, but I remember reading very vividly a groundbreaking book on prophecy and society in ancient Israel when I was a doctoral student. That's only one of his books. But he's been a very influential figure and a venerable teacher here. So Bob, we will turn the floor over to you and let you run the panel. All right, thank you, Greg. Um, I don't really uh, want to say a lot at the beginning here. I will make a couple of remarks about how the business of preparing people specifically for ministry, uh, how that has changed uh, over the years a bit, and then uh, we'll uh, simply go down the row of this distinguished panel. And uh, I'm going to ask each of you, please, when you begin, or before you begin, to give us some very brief indication of who you are and what you currently do, <laughs> that is, what your perspective is that you're bringing toward this. Uh, because I think that will be helpful. Uh, after we've heard all of the uh, statements, we may uh, talk uh, peacefully and quietly among ourselves uh, briefly, and then we will uh, invite the rest of you to uh, participate uh, in the discussion. Uh, I want to make two points uh, at the beginning about how Yale goes about the business of uh, preparing people for ministry. Uh, the points seem to be obvious, but they're worth saying in the current environment of theological education. The first one is that whatever we do, we do intentionally. That is to say, we don't back into training for ministry. Uh, this faculty has a long, long history, uh, going back to the days when uh, some of you were students here. Uh, has a very long tradition of agonizing over precisely what we need to be doing in uh, training folks for ministry. Uh, so it may look haphazard. And uh, one of the overall impressions that students get here is like going into a cafeteria when they arrive. And here are all these courses, uh, and then there are 1,200 additional ones in the university which they may sample. Uh, and the, the impression that they immediately get is there's no rhyme or reason at all to any of this. Uh, we can load up on desserts if we want to, and the, uh, the result won't really matter at the end. That's not what the faculty has in mind in doing this. So 
uh, just some reassurance that there has been and continues to be a kind of ongoing conversation about just what we ought to be doing. Uh, whether we do uh, the right things or not is, is something that I'll return to at the end and uh, maybe with a couple of suggestions of how we might improve that. The second thing I want to remind, uh, well, I, I should also say, given the climate today in uh, theological education, uh, it is becoming more and more of a luxury for a faculty to be able to sit down and think intentionally about what it is they want to do and to have very few limits on what they can do. And by that I mean that they are not bound by either uh, specific uh, oversight from some ecclesiastical organization that tells them what they have to be doing, nor are they bound, uh, and I'm sure this will come as a great shock to uh, Greg, they are really not bound by money in quite the same way. What we're seeing now in theological education generally, and I think it was pretty visible in the last two uh, Association of Theological Schools uh, pep talks that were given uh, at their recent meetings, more and more schools are simply worried about their very existence. They are becoming market driven in a way that is not necessarily going to lead them to be able to do the kind of uh, training for ministry that a place like Yale has the luxury of doing. Uh, they're worried about how can we get students, what do we have to do. It's a little like the college phenomenon. If you've uh, recently been through uh, with children or grandchildren trying to look for colleges, you know that they have very specific ideas about what they need in a college. Most of those things were not even available or thought about when we went to college. Uh, but now they are necessities uh, for these people. And this is leading colleges to market themselves uh, in a kind of uh, popularity contest for students. Uh, that doesn't always yield the best kind of student body. So increasingly we are aware here that the, we have a kind of luxury of being able to sit here and think intentionally about what the best kind of education is. Uh, for our students. The other thing, though, that we have to be mindful of is that just as the situation in ministry settings has changed over the last few years, so also have the students changed. And the best curriculum in the world, the best ideas about how we ought to train people for ministry aren't going to be any good if we don't have the students who are capable of taking advantage of those things. And one of the things that one notices here uh, over time is that the students have changed, and so we need to keep reminding ourselves of that. Uh, we're dealing with a very kind of, a different kind of student now than we were when I was a student longer ago than I want to think. I'm not up there with the 50 reunion class yet, but I will be soon. Uh, and uh, some of you will remember what the students were like in your own era. Uh, you were different then than the students now, and you were also different, for that matter, from the people who preceded you in this place. So generations of students do change, and what we have to do is figure out what the most effective way of uh, helping people become ministers is for the kinds of students that we deal with. Uh, to make a couple of points about them, they are pluralistic. They are highly diverse in their interests. Greg already uh, told you that roughly a third of them come here in straight academic degree programs. This is something that did not exist here, uh, say, 30 years ago. Uh, there really was only one degree here for all practical purposes. Um, and uh, everybody did that degree or something very much like it. The uh, situation now is quite different. Now we have people who are coming in. They have no particular interests in ministry, although some of them will back into it as they get into the mix of people who are looking toward ministry. Uh, they will change their minds about what they want to do. Uh, but they are mostly academics, and this creates both uh, possibilities in the classroom and problems in the classroom 
because you have two very different groups of people who have very different interests and expect very different things from the classes they take. And they will take different kinds of classes. So the old days when everybody in their first year was doing New Testament or Old Testament or systematic theology or history, and so you had a cohort of people who were going through this program together, and that was mutually enriching. You can't assume that that's going to happen these days. Uh, people are having very different uh, kinds of schedules. They have to deal uh, with putting all of that together and making sense out of it, often without direct help from their own fellow students, which is more of a challenge educationally. They have to uh, learn to deal with that. The second thing to stay, uh, say about our students is that many of them these days are coming from diverse experiences in ministry or with ministry. Uh, and more, much more diversity than was the case, say, 30 years ago, where most folks came out of a mainline Protestant denomination of some sort. They were likely mostly to be cradle Christians of one kind or another. Um, they pretty much stayed within their own denominational folds once they got here. They went out into churches that were very much like the churches they came from. That's no longer any of it true. Uh, they're coming now, uh, in some cases, what one might kindly describe as lightly churched. Um, that is to say, they really have not had much experience in real churches of any kind. Uh, increasingly, they have uh, had a good experiences in a college chaplaincy or in a para-church organization of some sort, which leads them now to consider ministry, and they arrive on our campus often without any particular denominational identity. And they're shopping, essentially. Uh, they're shopping both with an idea to uh, what kind of ministry they might want to participate in. They know already that there are varieties of ministry out there that they might uh, explore. But they don't really necessarily have a strong denominational identity. Sometimes they will find that here and they will often find it just uh, by associating with people. They will say, well, you know, the UCCs are really pretty nice people here, and so let's give the UCC a role. Or they will say the same thing about the Episcopalians or the Catholics, and on and on it goes. So it's very different from the kind of student that we used to get. Now that, again, always brings possibilities, but it also brings problems along with it. Uh, because as we all know, uh, people who enter college or who enter seminary are not always the same people who graduate. Uh, there's often a major life change that occurs sometime during that experience, which is not surprising. That's one of the things that we're up to. Uh, but when it happens, uh, the person who comes in thinking that they are Baptist finally decides that they want to be a candidacy for Episcopal orders at the end of the three years. Uh, this kind of experience, that is this, this sort of uh, heterogeneous background that, that our students bring to the place is enriching, sometimes infuriating, and a major educational challenge. <clears throat> so against that back kind of a background, just to help you understand where the pieces are on this chessboard. Um, let's just start with the panel, and uh, you're on. Um, thank you very much. My name is Nancy Taylor. I serve as senior minister and CEO of Old South Church in Boston. It's a, um, a UCC congregation, a historic and multicultural and urban. Um, but I, I also want to say that I've served um, little rural churches and I've served uh, other city churches. I've uh, been doing this for about 30 years and I also had a stint as a conference minister 
in, I was the minister and president of the Massachusetts Con Conference UCC, which oversaw the largest Protestant denomination in, the, in Massachusetts, in the Commonwealth. So I'm co coming at this from the perspective of a Christian minister who's interested in um, raising up the Christian church and raising disciples and forming disciples. Um, I don't know that I can presume to suggest how Yale Divinity School should be training people, but I'm gonna tell you what I see on my end of things. The first is my, my memory of the post 9-11 moment when um, everyone went back to church and who was it? I can't remember if it was Gustav Niebuhr or somebody in the New York Times said, only to then remember why they had left in the first place. <laughs> um, which is a devastating and true critique. As the minister and president of the Massachusetts Conference, I, I uh, parachuted into a different church every week, almost literally every week, um, did my sort of preach and run. But what I found there in churches was worship that was so shabby and prosaic, it was, there was no wonder nobody was there. So I'm, I'm echoing that quote um, from the New York Times, they all came back to church only to remember why they'd left. So I believe, and I, I have a, a worship credo here which I'll, I'll pass out, but it may be too long for me to go over, but I'm gonna start with my first thing that I believe about church or worship. I believe, I should say first, I believe that worship is the single most important thing that we do because it is there that we gather ourselves in the presence of God. It is there that we are to be formed and radicalized as Christians for service in the world. I believe that every Sunday, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, it is the responsibility of worship leaders to bring people to faith, to bring our congregation, that group of people gathered in the sanctuary that day, to bring them to faith, and thus to have anticipated either one, that they lost their faith sometime during the previous week, or two, they really never had it at all. I, I have a lot more to say about that, but I'm gonna just say that as my beginning and then pass it on. Oh no. Yes. <laughs> Taking. Well, excuse me for the bags under my eyes after suffering through uh, courses I could never take part-time um, and having just done my first sermon, initial trial sermon for my church on Tuesday night. I'll do my best to, to be here and be present giving all that has just happened or um, in the middle of this midterm, uh, this, this break time. But I am Trita Collier and I spent four years part-time here at Yale Divinity. And uh, first of all, it's a blessing to be able to be full-time this year. Um, I'm a second career, over 40 uh, student who in the middle of working at um, a prep school in New Hampshire um, realized that it was time to address the call to ministry. And so I uh, moved back to this area um, and um, having, after having applied to about seven schools because so many of my friends out there said, if you really wanna do this, you can't just apply to Yale. You've gotta really apply to a few schools. And having done that, um, I didn't get into Princeton, but um, here I am. And so um, I, I wanna share the reason why I chose Yale, one of the other schools that was also an option was Harvard. And um, I chose it because Harvard was making at that time a decision to become an academic institution. This was around 2007, 2008. There wasn't gonna be any more residential housing and they were being gonna focus on the academic, uh, that third you spoke about. And I, I knew that wasn't what I wanted and a few of the professors I would have gone there for um, were moving on. And the second reason I chose YDS um, was because you could start the practicum earlier. And uh, my vision was that I would really be able to become more involved in that way. As it turned out, I couldn't being full time um, uh, in the uh, obviously work world. So when you ask the question um, <clears throat> about what should YDS be preparing students for, and I think about me having come to Yale after being in education for over 25 years and um, 
and having spent 20 years in the same church, the American Baptist Church, um, we're one of the largest churches in New England, First Baptist Church in uh, Bloomfield, Connecticut. And um, having been involved in ministry, um, I started an organization called Sweet Sanctuary, an organization connecting resources to save our girls, housing girls who didn't have places to stay, especially during their breaks from school or in summers. Um, so I came here with a clear sense of mission, a clear sense of um, uh, uh, calling, um, and, um, and established in the church. Um, so when I thought about um, being prepared, I have to be honest with you, I didn't think about um, becoming a pastor. I didn't, I wanted to go into ministry. I read a book called God's Yes is Louder Than My No, and I thought about being prepared for ministry as many um, as us need to be prepared. Oftentimes um, in churches, we're not prepared for ministry. I wasn't thinking of preaching. But um, in fact, I'm now being prepared at YDS to preach. I'm taking principles of preaching after having spent the summer as a supply preacher um, already. I'm now learning the things I didn't do so well um, in class. And um, I also am taking classes like church history um, this year as a full-time student and Old Testament uh, which turns your whole experience as a Christian upside down. Um, so when I say being prepared for ministry, I have uh, many ways I could share, and we'll share later, um, about the, the ways I'm being prepared um, in terms of practicum and also being prepared as a leader. But I have to be honest with you, I don't know that I am sure what that will be after I graduate in May. I thought for sure it'd be going back into a school and becoming a school cha chaplain, but I'm not so sure. Thank you. Hi, I'm S Steve Bauman, and I am the senior minister of Christ Church in New York City, which is a United Methodist congregation. I just this past Wednesday celebrated, the church celebrated, we all celebrated my 25th year there. So it's been a long haul. The thing I would tell you about it is that when I got there in my early 30s, um, <clears throat> I was con the new thing that, that was decided that the church needed since it was near internal collapse. And um, I was woefully unprepared for that role. That is to say, I, I did have some street smarts, which served me well. But um, a church with a glorious past and Christ Church has all of the uh, accoutrements of looking like it has a glorious past and coming into a, a d completely dysfunctional, demoralized, and tiny group of odd people and then trying to you know, do your thing was a daunting challenge. I've also had a lot of um, experience in not-for-profit work. I'm a, a founding board member of a partnership of faith in New York City, which is um, an interreligious, actually the, most, the Abrahamic faith uh, religious leaders. We started that in the early 90s. And there have been a number of other things that I've been involved with um, in a not-for-profit way. When uh, asked about this topic, um, I was ruminating about <laughs> what point of view I would bring. And then, lo and behold, into, in the mail came this from Yale last week, the Eli Magazine for donors, and wouldn't you know that right on the cover was the Mars Family Fund's leadership education at the Yale uh, School of Business. And I'm coming at this from the standpoint of the necessity of, or what I believe to be the necessity of Yale Divinity to be training professionals for leadership in whatever the range of occupations may be. They're training professionals for leadership. And, and it actually says that's their motto, leaders for church and world, right? To be very explicit, self-aware, and confident about the expectation that they are training leaders for the world, regardless of what that leadership looks like. And I just, just for instance, in the article inside this, it says, it says, 
with a mission to develop leaders for the private, public, nonprofit, and entrepreneurial sectors. And I would say that's exactly what YDS is interested in doing as well. Uh, the redesigned leadership development program is the result of a rigorous faculty review that considered how to expand upon the classroom-based leadership training embedded in the school's integrated curriculum. This program will now touch all aspects of the student experience. And most notably, it offers a host of active leadership components, including opportunities to give and receive feedback. I don't want to spend a lot more time uh, in this moment, but I want to just underline my thought that it is crucial for YDS to be very, very clear up front about this as their principal project. It's my bias. That leads well into what I think I'd like to say this morning. I'm Willis Jenkins. I teach social ethics here. Uh, and I, I want to respond also to something that, that Bob said earlier, that, that, the, that students are not the same, sometimes not the same people who graduate. And I want to say, I take that as a mark of success. We've done our job well when that happens. And, and in particular around leadership for uh, a changing religious scene and a changing professional scene. Um, the kinds of classes I have the opportunity to offer allow me to um, tr try and create courses that allow students to develop a professional creativity, to develop their pastoral imagination, and some entrepreneurship. And I want to answer our question in this forum just by describing a few of the classes that, that I teach. Um, I don't mean to say this is an authoritative way, that, authoritative answer to how we ought to be preparing our students. You can offer feedback on that. Um, but one uh, in which Trina was an outstanding student. Um, <laughs> Neighborhood ethics a few years ago, I was interested, I am interested in how we prepare leaders to take part in the, in the kinds of civic and political and economic questions that arise from life in a place like New Haven, full of all kinds of problems that, that relate to what's happening in cities all across this country. So I put together, um, without having the resources myself and my own training and being brand new to New Haven, I put together a great group of people who, um, who work, some, including some YDS grads who work in social services in New Haven. And we put together a class focused on, particularly focused on homelessness in New Haven as a way of thinking how do we do theological and ethical and social thinking for, for the kind of leadership that will matter to the kinds of problems that we're gonna face later on in our careers. Um, and I, one, two things I'm really happy about that came out of that class, and not as a direct application, but just as a consequence of who was gathered to create this, this pedagogical project. One is um, Chapel on the Green, which is a, um, a, a, a remarkable ecclesial experiment in outside church on the New Haven Green for people who are not comfortable worshiping inside. Um, Julie's been a, Julie Kelsey's been a, a, a great figure in that. Um, and, and the other is uh, Abraham's Tent, which is a sort of a roving emergency homeless shelter that takes place in different churches around New Haven. Both of those things um, happen because of the people who were convened to think through what leadership ought to look like, what can religious leaders do in a meaningful way in this city that other professionals can't do. Um, partly out of the conversations of that, again with important prods from Julie Kelsey here, um, we have developed this year a year-long social justice class that includes uh, a supervised ministry internship. That's to say students can meet their supervised ministry requirement, all six hours of it, with an internship that has some component of social engagement. And they do a regular course in Christian ethics alongside of that as a way to think through basic questions in Christian ethics, organized around the question, what is social justice, in, ref in and through reflection on one's professional mentorship. So far, it's exciting. <laughs> it's experiment. we'll see how it goes. Um, two other quick things I want to mention. Uh, last year I taught a class with an ecologist at the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Sciences on the ecology and ethics of biodiversity management. Focused really particularly on the kinds of professional questions that arise for people who graduate from the forestry school, but conducted with five students from the forestry school and five students from the divinity school. And as you can imagine, five students trained in the ethos and framework of scientific thinking and five students um, with the adventurous spirit that YDS students have to think about all kinds of values and meta narratives and religious questions, and to put these two, two students together to think about the dimensions of questions like how do you do responsible biodiversity management in a, uh, on, a, on a globe of pervasive human power? Which this comes up for FES graduates in little things like um, should 
um, when we're doing um, species conservation, should we actually assist in the migration of species to adapt to climate change? Is that, is that sort of too much intervention, or is that um, the responsible thing to do? And you can imagine the, the background kinds of philosophical questions in that really quickly get to what is the human place in nature? It was great to see these two students uh, try and help each other work through those kinds of practical problems. Uh, and we're, we're going to run that course again. It was, it, was really, it was really successful, I think. Fourth class, um, and one I did this past summer with Jan Holton in Pastoral Care on refugee ethics and pastoral care, in which we did a travel seminar to Uganda and Rwanda. And the most exciting part of this was that we created this trip and this seminar with an equal number of students and faculty from Uganda Christian University, which is one of the most important rising theological schools in East Africa. And I think what I'm most excited about this, I mean, there was, there's obviously there are um, powerful questions about how to respond to human suffering and to what seemed to be overwhelming questions of political conflict. But what was most exciting was to try and develop responses to that, pastoral, theological, and professional responses to that, with theological students from an entirely different theological place in Christendom <laughs> um, and in, uh, you know, across all the differences that are involved in doing in working with faculty and students from East Africa and faculty and students from North America. Um, and uh, that's an ongoing project that I'm, I'm excited about. And I think it's really important for our students to think about what it means to do, what it means to be pastoral leaders, even if they're not going to go work in Africa. What it means to be pastoral leaders in a world of theological diversity and, and increasing um, inequities and in social power. I'll leave it there. Hello, my name is Steve Carlson. I'm the Dean of Christ Church Cathedral in Indianapolis, Indiana. I've been there um, five and a half years, been ordained as an Episcopal priest for nearly 16. And um, it's kind of funny for me to end up on this panel because I'm not a graduate of Yale Divinity School or I did go to Berkeley Divinity I'm at the University of Chicago Divinity School. And, um, but Professor Wilson, as you were describing how students change as they uh, have been coming to this institution, you're sort of describing what it was like for me when I showed up at Princeton Theological Seminary, um, thinking, well, it doesn't matter what degree program I'm in. I think I'm an Episcopalian, but it doesn't matter that there are a bunch of Presbyterians here. And I don't know what my future holds. Maybe academics. I, I, I had no idea. I was pursuing a, a purely accidental education. And, uh, and I, I ended up transferring to the University of Chicago and what I found there that was really vital and important was to be a, around, not just in a church setting, but with students from a whole variety of different faith traditions, backgrounds, and, and a, ver a whole variety of different futures. Uh, just as you've been describing what the students are here, here like uh, the, um, and so when I, I eventually made my way to the church, I embraced my de denomination, I, entered into the um, sort of grinding mechanics of the institution and um, became ordained and now I'm working in a church. Um, I, I'm connected here because I'm on the board at Berkeley Divinity School, uh, trustee, um, because I kept running across YDS. First of all, I found out that the colleagues I connected with in the Episcopal Church, m most of them went here. Um, when I've had to go hire clergy, we get the opportunity to hire someone. Um, I consistently find amazing students here that, so now this is, I always come here to interview when I have an opportunity to hire someone fresh out of seminary. Because I think it's, it does, it does, it does what I valued in my education. I want, I don't want to hire anyone who comes from a purely church world, living in an institution that doesn't face how much things are changing, and how vari wide variety of backgrounds, how fluid everything is now. But I've noticed that the graduates who come here, they, they know that future really well, they live it, and then they're grounded in tradition and uh, training and the um, intellectual tradition, and I found they're very, very well prepared. And the ones I've hired have been, um, instrumental in the work I'm doing in the church where I am. Um, and because I think what you're describing that you're facing among the students is exactly what's going on in the church. The, um, we got, I'm, my church is 175 years old. We have a men and boys choir that's been around for 150 years. 
you know, these great traditions, legacies that are just, I mean, the music that I get to experience on a Sunday morning, I pinch myself to be able to sit and hear this week by week by week. But I also know that it's a legacy, that, that it's, its path into the future is really up for question. And I, I, I need to be a sort of priest and, and have colleagues with whom I work who understand both parts of that, that we carry with us a wonderful legacy. And the path to the future is, is more and more uncertain, and it's, it's getting more uncertain more quickly. I, I think that the church has changed in my 15 years of, of uh, ordained ministry, has changed substantially within that 15 years, and the rate of change is increasing. So I find people here prepared to, to enter that, that challenge and find real opportunity and wonder in it. I, if I just may say, if I didn't make it clear that uh, as I listen to you all, I just want to emphasize that although I don't know my path, I, I share that the importance of a program like this um, making sure we understand the missions and having either a heart to do that work or a reasonable understanding of the changes that require us to have a basic understanding no matter what area we choose of what's happening and what's changing um, around um, you know, our country and, and, and faith. Okay, thank you. Um, at the risk of uh, oversimplifying, it, it seems to me that we've heard several things from our, our panelists. One is the assurance that no matter where we think or how well we think we understand ministry <laughs> settings, we are inevitably going to be surprised when we actually get into one. That is to say, um, there is no way of predicting accurately exactly what one is going to find. That seems to suggest, on the one hand, that people have to be prepared better to think on their feet, as it were. That is, they need to be able to analyze what they're looking at when they get into a setting, when they get into a congregation, and so on. Uh, and that uh, the degree to which we train our folks to be able to, to use their skills uh, to uh, look at that uh, will determine how successful our, our graduates are going to be. Uh, the other thing that we heard, though, is uh, a plea for some very traditional things that are associated. Uh, and Nancy's remarks about the importance of worship, for example, as the one place that people usually first touch ministry. That is, when people are visiting some kind of a ministry setting, it's the worship life that is likely to be the thing that either repels them or attracts them. You can build on that, but that's the first thing that you see. So uh, there certainly is a place in the training of folks here for some very traditional kinds of things to go on, although not necessarily in a traditional way. And if you've been through, as my denomination has, the worship wars, for example, uh, about whether there's going to be an organ or whether there's going to be a guitar or both, uh, we haven't yet gotten the Institute of Sacred Music. I don't see Martin. Uh, the Institute of Sacred Music to institute liturgical guitar, but I keep hoping that maybe they will move in that direction. Um, so these, these kinds of issues about how one does this continue to go on, but the fact of needing to do them it seems to be clear enough. Uh, now, so um, it seems to me that Yale is well positioned in, because of its university setting, uh, particularly, to do uh, sort of different things when it comes to helping students expand their ability to interact. So uh, one question I have for the panel would be, uh, can you make some suggestions about how these things ought to be balanced off? I mean, there are infinite resources in a way around the university to do things but you can't possibly take advantage of all of them. Uh, similarly, there are some very traditional things, and if you heard uh, Greg's inaugural address as dean a couple of days ago, he was talking about the importance of <coughs> continuing to do well the kinds of traditional things that we have always done, though clearly not 
to the exclusion of other things. One has to get the right balance. So do you have any thoughts about how the school, as it thinks about how it prepares ministers, uh, do you have any thoughts about how to balance off these sort of traditional ways of training which continue to go on and in some ways because of the sort of lightly churched character of many of our students have to be done and have to be done more rigorously and intentionally than might have been true 30 years ago. If they don't come knowing Bible anymore necessarily, for example, that's a big hole in their background that has to be fixed. Uh, whatever people expect of their clergy, they expect them to be learned in the faith, whatever that faith is going to be. So there are certain traditional things that have to be attended to. Uh, so how does one balance that off with uh, a kind of broader training, which Yale is ideally positioned to, to offer? Uh, and we've already gotten some examples of the, the uh, way in which it interacts now with the forestry school, it interacts with the law school, it interacts uh, with various departments in Yale College interacts with the School of Organization and Management. We have students taking courses in all of these different places. So the opportunities are there. How does one strike the balance and what do you think of as a kind of useful balance that would, would help us to move more efficiently into where we want to be? Go for it. I don't think I'm going to answer that question. <laughs> um, well, sorry. This I, is not an oral it's, exam. It's, a, <laughs> it's, a, it's, an, it's an important question, but I think what, what I want to, to say, um, I want you to hear, the, is the degree to which to be a Christian pastor today, you have to be a Christian apologist and an evangelist every minute of every day. I think that Paul's example, he was so strategic, so patient, so determined, Every single word he used was, was a word of, of exhortation and invitation and encouragement or chastisement or you know, teaching. And um, I, I think that we're back there, that, that this faith is so new to our congregation, in fact, that we have to think of ourselves on a fundamental level of what it is to remind people of, of what it is to be a Christian and what does it mean to be formed and shaped for God in the world. Um, I had a fantastic education here at YDS, but I don't think it was pitched, Now this was a long time ago, 30 years ago, as I was gonna come out as an evangelist or an apologist. I read some really old apologists, but nobody was expecting me to become one. I, I and, not, and not just to my, my Jewish and Muslim colleagues or, my, or, my, or the nuns or the Buddhists, but to the people in my congregation. I, I, I wanna, Keep coming to there. Um, not only are you um, receiving people who are not uh, brought up in the faith, shaped in the faith, s coming into our churches today, we're doing adult baptisms all the time now. Um, there's a lot of work and responsibility for us, but it's also pretty darn exciting. People are claiming the faith as adults. And that has shaped my, my ministry, Old South Ministry has been quite different now than it used to be because we are, we are convinced that most of the people in our church really don't know that much about God or the tradition or the faith or what it really means to live as a Christian or what Christian courage is about. So we're at that kind of elemental level and it's exciting, it's good work. Um, I don't know if that answers your question about balance, but it's, um, it's, it's as a Christian pastor, again, I'm not, an academician here at Yale, as a pastor fighting for the life of the Christian church, which is always one generation away from dying out, and we're getting really close. Um, I think we're, you know, the training of evangelists and apologists who can bring the faith with excitement and confidence um, and tenderness in a world filled with violence and um, death. I think we have a story to tell that is so amazing today if we can tell it right, if we can tell it with the excitement that we first discovered it when we first became Christians ourselves. Let me add to that. I love your energy. Uh, I, I want to add that I think that's uh, crucial, and especially for me, uh, given my tradition and my background. Um, but let me also add that we do know that 
Sunday morning is still the most segregated hour in America. And um, so this idea of what do we do about differences? Uh, we just had a wonderful uh, racism workshop. Um, and in my five years here, I said, why is this the first time that we're doing anything as an entire, as a, a school-wide um, addressing our differences? Uh, and I also was a TA um, in the School of Management and will also be taking a course there in the spring in the hopes of graduating with the ELM degree. And, and I marvel at the fact that people in the School of Management have to take courses on group dynamics and team building and understanding differences and knowing your character traits and your um, strengths and, and also those people who may not be like you. Um, and so we went through these different uh, exercises where it, it was important to know who you are, but also you know who's on the other side. Um, and, and so I, I just think that's, that's really crucial um, in terms of thinking about how we create balance. I don't know how to fit it all in, having been a, a former school administrator. Um, I think that's for the dean to figure out, but I do think the, the, the whole is um, um, this idea of worship. And, and I, I, there's some of us that really feel like we come here already strong in our faith, and we're not looking for YDS to be an institution that help that that drives our faith, um, but I I certainly know that um, we have a, a experience in Marquand, but I don't necessarily go in all my classes and we have prayer before class. There are some classes that may, um, so I just want to share that. In addition to feeling like, what's the responsibility of us to think about worship and us as a, a Christian uh, Christians? Um, and the Christian church, and the same idea is that what do we do with regard to social justice? What do we do with regard to training us to be prepared for the diverse world in which we live? Thank you. You know, it's very hard to presume to <laughs> know exactly what to say to the question, not really knowing what goes on as a student today. So I'll, I'll, with that caveat, let me say that coming back to my point of view around training leaders for the world, I think that lens could prove to be a very useful lens uh, uh, around defining what the balance points are in the curriculum. And I would echo something Nancy inferred. The way my ministry has evolved, I'm much clearer today that my ministry is far leaner than it was. My focus is far leaner than it was and much more focused. And um, the, the education I received at Yale at the time is not appropriate for the reality that is today, in my opinion. That is, it's not focused. It, I'm thinking now back to the 70s. It wasn't as focused and as lean as what the environment requires today. And as well, picking up on your thoughts about training people for the world we're actually embracing, I don't think that was self-conscious, or conscious, if you will, particularly in the 70s when I was going through YDS. But that reality is absolutely imperative. And as much as I agree with the idea that our worship has to be crackerjack, it also has to be lean, focused, and geared to um, adult transformation and not just raising up kids. I believe that strongly. I'm in complete agreement with that. At the same time, we all know that church is evolving in radical ways and the whole emergence movement. Where is worship actually taking place? Where are people congregating? How is that happening? How are social ethics being, this sounded very exciting to me, what you were talking about, and how is that being uh, embodied, lived out, translated into the communities? Um, all of those things are, seem to me part and parcel of what a curriculum could look like if it was organized around training effective, thoughtful leaders. And Bob, as you said, people who are capable of the dance, and not just a frame of reference, but they're capable of dancing out there uh, to respond to what's there. Um, really crucial, I think. Mm -hmm. Maybe the rest of you want to weigh in on this? 
I'm trying to think of what to say. The, um, in the challenges that we face today, I find myself going back to, to material that I first encountered uh, in basic courses of scripture studies, Hebrew Bible, New Testament, church history, theology, and remembering that some of my, some of my profound moments of spiritual growth happened in those courses. It wasn't, those weren't just, they, didn't, they weren't to me anyway dry surveys of past stuff. I was sort of digesting the whole his, history of my faith in those courses that, that fed me. And, and as, I'm sort of reluctant to say, let's, let's adapt everything to a changing environment. But I don't think anyone has it figured out where we're going. So try, you know, I, don't, I wouldn't know where to aim someone. But I do know that when I have to adapt my message to try and really be a missionary, I go back to the message we're trying to preach and look at Paul and how he communicated where he was in various places and how to translate. And I'll give you an example that I was fortunate to come into my congregation with a very lively and active Hispanic congregation. And they are continually teaching me how my expression of Christianity is uh, in culture that is not the dominant or the generic. It is, you know, English in a weird Episcopal kind of way. It's <laughs> white. It reflects certain economic conditions. And realize that if we're going to translate the gospel to this new immigrant group, we have to learn, we actually have to learn it better and help us get, sort of strip away some of those layers of things that actually are not that critical to the gospel. And it gets leaner and clearer. And I do that both by, by these new encounters, but also by going back to the original sources and digging deeper. And I'm finding them new ways, and I was equipped to do that in Divinity School. Uh, let me, uh, before I open this, which uh, you have been very patient, those of you who are sitting here, uh, and mostly uh, not uh, making loud noises and waving your hands in the air. Uh, so I want to give you a chance to uh, react to what has been said or to ask questions of any of the panelists that you might want to talk to. Uh, but I will throw in, in, in the light of your uh, comment, that there is another program which has worked uh, very well here, and that's Bill Gettler's uh, Pastor's Study uh, program, where every couple of weeks he invites someone uh, in ministry in to have a, an hour-long conversation with anyone who wants to come uh, over lunch. And these are uh, mostly successful ministers by some description. That is often non-traditional, sometimes very traditional, a wide variety of people. And uh, what this does, of course, is to give our uh, folks here a chance to interact with varieties of different kinds of ministry. Uh, that they might not otherwise experience. And this has been, in my view at least, a very successful um, sort of experiment. And what you can do is a, a paracurricular para uh, way of exploring ministry. But uh, I just wanted to throw that in before we got uh, any further. So you have been very patient. Uh, reactions, questions, comments, yes. more about that here, putting a sharper definitional point on those terms, or by illustration? It's not unlike what Nancy was saying, in the fact that our culture is, is largely ignorant of the religious tradition, in my opinion. So I'm in New York. I have a very, um, we're a very diverse congregation in all ways except one. I'd say 98% has a college degree. So we're not diverse in that way, but we're diverse uh, in lots of other ways, nearly every way we could say. But for that high level of education, I would still tell you that my congregation is largely ignorant of historic uh, trains of thought, I'll put it that way, trains of thought around the Chris Christian tradition. They are not biblically literate. Um, they are occasionally passionate in their faith. 
They are moderately committed to making this thing work. Uh, that is, making their own faith thing work. Um, so what that, does, what that says to me is I don't have the luxury of, mm, you know, toying around with pleasantries, uh, even of pleasantries of theological reflection. I mean, I can do that on my own. But in terms of my own leadership in the church, I have to be like a laser, in my opinion. You just have to be a laser so that whether you're in a committee meeting, you're representing your point of view, which is coming out of this faith perspective. Whether you're in worship, there's a, con there's a consistent uh, word that's being shared always, no matter what the context is. So whether it's in the committee meeting, whether I'm in a counseling setting, whether I'm leading worship or preaching, I try to be as ruthlessly consistent myself as I can be. In fact, it's one of the hardest disciplines I find, to tell you the truth and not be all things to all people in that sense, in that broadest sense, but instead give up some of the being all things to all people and be who I am and represent what I've got. And, uh, and what I've got is leaner in this sense, sharper, clearer. And I also think that the culture needs this. It's, it's very bereft. I just was thinking, um, I've been thinking lately about the matter of character and Christian character, and I've adopted this as a theme for my year. Um, what does it mean to um, emerge as a mature Christian in your character? What does Christian character actually look like? Talk, we don't talk about character in our culture at all, ever. We don't talk about virtue. It's a dirty word almost. In fact. If you bring it up, you know, you'll, heads will turn. And yet, I am convinced that it's extremely important for leaders in our culture, particularly Christian leaders, to be formed and to be on the docket, on the, you know, they have to hold themselves accountable to ever deeper, uh, meaningful ways of growing up to be persons of great character in our culture. I, I just feel this really strongly. And, and um, I'm using that as an example. So that's a lean, th that's, a, that's what I mean by leanness. I'm going to be pushing this all year, that idea, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, okay. Okay. I saw some other hands a minute ago. Yes. And ever since I ran, ever since I first heard the dean and his opening message, all through this, I've heard about the decline of the Protestant church. And then today I heard for the first time that the major denomination here is a Catholic church. Is that correct, Dean? It's the, it's the second largest group of students we have a Roman Catholic. And I understand, if I've seen the statistics correctly, that the majority of students here are women? I think that's correct. Just and I want to ask barely you, that. Where yeah. can a woman go in the Catholic Church to be employed after leaving Yale Divinity School? In, only in lay ministry right now. Uh, I'm not a Roman Catholic, uh, but I serve in a very famous Roman Catholic institution for 23 years. And there is some hope that women will be allowed to serve as deacon uh, within the Roman Catholic Church. And if so, we would be very happy to help facilitate that here. <laughs> but that's not a decision. If, if it were my decision to make, it would be made. <laughs> but it's not my decision to make. So no, I, wasn't, I wasn't charging you with it. But I want to raise the question whether Yale should be putting some any pressure on the Roman Catholics to accept women in the priesthood, which I firmly believe in. Although I'm not Catholic. <laughs> I don't want to speak to that either because I'm also not, I'm also not Catholic. Um, 
I will say that my, uh, just uh, sort of following the news releases, uh, at the moment the Catholic Church does not seem to be open to any kind of pressure about anything much. Uh, and that is a particular problem I think that many of our Catholic students are, are struggling with. Uh, there are indeed still, uh, much to my amazement in this country, opportunities for lay ministry for Catholics. Uh, which was something that for a while it looked as if the Vatican wanted to shut down, but it didn't seem to be successful in doing that. So uh, it seems to be re-emerging, and I will say about many of our Catholic women <clears throat> that they still believe that they will have a vital ministry in a Catholic context when they get out of here. So we, uh, they do the same kind of training that everybody else does. They are fully prepared to do this as best we can train them. Uh, and I admire their courage in continuing to think this way. Yeah. Uh, one of the best courses I had at YDS in the late 1950s was in preaching. And the assignment was to preach a sermon <coughs> do not use a single religious or theological word. No, nothing like redemption, salvation, uh, you know, nothing, no religious word. And it seems to me Yale in Community School now has to train people to speak the language, understand the language of your 98% of your congregation, which you know are highly educated, but speak totally different languages as, as lawyers, as city planners, as physicians. Politicians, you know, all the members of your church, but to translate all of your, your Christian terminology into language that they not only understand but speak. And it seems to me that's something of a challenge for something like the old Yeah, I wish uh, Tom Troger and Nora Tubbs Tisdale were here. They're our two homiletics people. We have an absolutely incredible preaching program here. Uh, which, uh, among its other strengths, is its interaction with the uh, various nonverbal forms of worship that, that circulate around the Institute of Sacred Music, which involves not just music, but other forms of art as well. So uh, they would fully uh, appreciate your comment, and they've done some absolutely remarkable things in the, in the uh, preaching courses. You saw a little of that if you've been to chapel here, since you've been here. You've seen a little of that kind of uh, experimentation. Uh, I think that's absolutely right. Yes. Uh, um, <clears throat> I really hear what you're saying about worship, justice, leadership, partnership, and kind of self-reflection of the kind of privilege of doing things, and then the question of, what will it still be there to do it? Um, and so I want to ask you, as well as the alums who are here, I feel like I'm that guy that just got all the technology to rise up into space, and he just did that two-hour drop. And it feels like you're here at YDS and you're empowered, and then you take the plunge into the world, into your work, and I'm confident in doing that. A lot of what you all are saying is about being superheroes. I'm confident doing that in certain ways. But what do you think about the partnership possibilities as an institution to address this question of what are we training them to do or how are we helping them between when they graduate and, and the, the alumni body, how can partnerships occur there? Do they need to occur um, for people that are out there in parishes? Um, is that an opportunity that we can think more about? I don't want to talk too much, but I do have a very strong point of view on, I think, what you're getting at. And one of the um, components of developing leaders here at, at Yale, it seems to me, is to develop 
collaborative leaders. And I am very conscious of the fact that I cannot um, function as a superhero in my environment, and I insist that I am not, although I probably betray, my ego probably betrays me from time to time, I'm sure. But to that point, um, I have been the part of the same support group for over 30 years. Um, and it has Christians of different denominations, and it's had rabbis over the years and so on. Um, I'm using that as a small example of we're not training singular lone rangers here, and then you go off and conquer the world, in my opinion. We're training people who are learning how to remain alert and competent and part of that competency is to be relentless about maintaining collaborative and collegial relationships that are authentic, deep, searing, piercing, and keeping you honest and on track. Um, now that's a personal professional commitment. I also hear you saying something a bit more organized and professional in nature. And I also think there are probably ways. I would be, for instance, as one minister who's not far away from YDS, of being available to be part of groups of students or recent alums who are in the area, I would be very willing to participate in that. Actually, I need to learn that way. I, w I know there are things that recent grads would have that I need to be learning about, thinking about. So I, those are two short answers, but I, gosh, I really think the Lone Ranger thing is real bad. Oh, I do too. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think it's what gets people into trouble over and over. When you see clergy getting into trouble, often it's a result of this moment. I would just follow up to say make sure you get into any number of colleague groups. I'm, I'm in probably four or five. Um, it's really important. You, you, you start to see patterns if something, if there's a problem among us, yeah. you start to, you learn a lot and you don't even know you're learning it half the time until afterwards. Um, and if your tradition doesn't, get you into one, which I hope it will, create your own. Um, and I think we are all mentors and mentoring, right. both. And yes, I'm, I'm, we always have young people at our church who are teaching church, and we learn a lot from them. They bring such good life to us. But there's a few things I know, too, that, to, to help them. Um, constantly, we have to be interacting. Yeah, let me follow up on that. Um, I do, uh, from time to time, go around and do continuing education things for the various associations of the UCC in Connecticut. <clears throat> and the, uh, many of those folks are, of course, our former graduates. And uh, one thing that always strikes me in recent years, anyway, is the remarkable amount of clergy burnout that I'm looking at. Um, over and over, I see these people who have been in ministry for 15 years or 20 years, which is not a terribly long time, really, and they're already retired. They've, they've started, they just couldn't handle it anymore. There are sociological reasons for that, which I won't go into, but the ones who have dealt with it most successfully and dealt with the strains of ministry are the ones who have gathered together the Fairfield County Association, for example, has a regular, within certain local areas, has a regular weekly study conversation thing for their clergy. Uh, they, people can go to that, they can talk freely. It's the old version of the Monday morning quarterback thing that so many clergy get involved in, which is, can be very sustaining if it's run well. And it's just terribly important, I think, for people to do that. The other thing is that it strikes me that uh, picking up on your comment, Stephen, that um, for a long time it has been the model, ever since the seminary as an institution developed, it's not an old institution. I mean, the idea of going to a seminary for training for ministry is not a, an old traditional thing to do. Uh, in the old days, uh, churches trained their clergy in various ways. Since the institution of the seminary, more and more churches have gotten out of the business of participating really in any way in the training of their own clergy. And uh, what has happened, therefore, is that they leave it up to the seminaries to provide what the seminaries think the churches need. The churches then review the market when they need to hire. They look out there to see what's there. They hire somebody. 
uh, for some reason or another. It seems to me that we need to do better than that in some way. And that in some way the churches need to take responsibility again for the training of their own clergy. And that suggests some kind of a new model in which uh, people who are practicing ministry would have a stronger interaction with seminaries. And I think Yale can get away with it because it's not going to be interested in a totally theologically driven relationship. That it could be much more fruitful than that. And I think we have the freedom to do that. Um, it's just, as always, the question of how one would put in place something like that. We're about at the end of our time. Uh, Greg, you have something to... I'd like just to say, well, first I want to say on a personal note, thank you to all of you and to you for the voices that you've articulated to help me think through things that will help shape this seminary. And I have two reflections, and I hope you'll hear them both. I, as I'm thinking of the panel, I'm looking at Bob and Willis, and I, these are two exceptionally bright individuals. If you want to think of this statistically, which I oftentimes think in these terms, one and a half percent of the population of the United States as a doctorate of some kind. We're interested in less than 1% of that 1.5% to be on our faculty. We are interested in a very small sliver because we want people like them who will challenge people intellectually, hone their mind, not so that they will be scholars in parishes, but so that they will be the intellectual leaders of their parishes. And I am making a commitment to bring more people, and we have here today three people, I've already, and I've said this in other context, whom I personally have great admiration for in their work in ministry, Nancy and Steve and Steve, and what the three of them have done with the churches that they serve, uh, I think are models for what I would hope our students, and Trita represents the bright hope of our future uh, here. So for a very remarkable panel, we will find ways not just on convocation weekends, but on a much more consistent basis to have the voices of people in the churches here present with our students uh, without in any way backing off from the quality of having our students' minds honed and shaped by people of the caliber of Willis and Bob. So I want to say thank you, and that's my pledge from this discussion. Thank you.